Welcome to the Open to Hope Show. I'm your host, Dr. Heidi Horsley, and I'm here today with my two guests, John and Lisa. My mom is not joining us today, unfortunately. She couldn't make it. Um, but I have great guests that are going to talk to us a lot today about who grieves harder after spouse loss, men or women. And both of our guests are no stranger to spouse loss because they both lost their spouses when they were only in their 30s. So we'll be talking today with John Polo, who has been on our podcast. And he is a hope and empowerment coach. And he has a best-selling bo book called Widowed Rants, Raves, and Randoms. I've got it right here. And we will talk, be talking to him today about uh, rants, raves, and randoms. He's going to give us some of those. Um, he's very candid and upfront about what it's like to be a brief spouse, which I love, because I don't like it when we sugarcoat grief and loss. I think he tells it like it is. Um, joining him will also be Lisa Kolb. She is our other guest. Lisa is a food writer and the ex-assistant district attorney in the Bronx, and she also is, has lost a spouse. So welcome to the show, John and Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so John, we're going to start with you today. I want you to tell us a little bit about uh, Michelle and your loss and what got you where you are today. Sure. So um, Michelle and I grew up in the same town. Um, we didn't really talk to each other ever until we both moved about an hour away. Mm -hmm. um, we would go back to that same town to hang out with our friends, and we started dating at that point. I was 17, and she was 16. Um, as young as we were, it was that soulmate-type love. Yeah. But we both had issues. I had self-esteem issues. She had self-worth issues. It didn't work mm -hmm. out. We dated for about a year and we broke up. Um, about seven years later, I was checking my email and I saw her name pop up and I had a panic attack because mm -hmm. I had loved her the whole time. Yeah. Um, but we had lost contact. Um, she had been emailing me condolences on my dad who had passed away. Mm -hmm. One thing led to another and we talked for about a year before we saw each other. She came to visit me and it was like we picked up where we had left off. Wow. Yeah. So we dated for about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. I proposed. It was a good proposal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love it. I gave it a lot of thought. Um, a year after I proposed, she got diagnosed with cancer. Wow. So wow. tomorrow will actually be five years since she was diagnosed. Wow. Um, they thought it was kidney cancer at first. It mm -hmm. wasn't. It was a rare form of sarcoma. Mm. The specialist in New York said it was one in seven billion. Wow. Yeah. Um, she had it for two and a half years before she passed away. How did she even know she had it? Back pain. Oh, back pain. Very okay. severe back pain. Wow. They ran the scan four times before they saw it. Wow. But and then so finally they saw the tumor. Within two and a half years, she, she died, basically. Is right. that what you're saying? They, it was very quick. Yeah. Lots of surgeries, lots of chemo, radiation, mm -hmm. immunotherapy, clinical trials, all that stuff. Wow. But yeah, January of 2016, she passed away. So that wasn't that long ago? No, two and a half years. Mm -hmm. So we were had two and a half years where she was healthy, two and a half mm -hmm. years where she passed, and now it's been two and a half years. I'm sorry, two and a half years where she battled it, and now it's been two and a half years since she's passed. That's interesting. Yeah. Looking at the two and a half, yeah. two and a half, and two and a half, right? <laughs> right? And I know you have thousands of people. You have a blog with thousands of people. I forgot to tell the audience. And how can they get a hold? How can they find that blog? A month after she passed, yes. I started it to kind of keep her memory alive. Mm -hmm. When she was dying, she would cry to me a lot that everyone would forget her, including her daughter. Wow. So about a month after, I wanted to just keep her memory alive. That was the point of it. Mm -hmm. um, I named it Better Not Bitter Widower because the entire time she was sick, mm -hmm. I was very bitter. Understandably so. Right. And I overcame that kind of the, the 23rd hour of hospice. Wow. It's when I kind of found my peace with what was going on. So I named it that. I started a Facebook page. I started writing. Um, there's about 21,000 people who follow me now. That's amazing. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering to backtrack a little bit. How did you find your peace at the 23rd hour? Because I know that there's people out there that are not there and they're still very, very bitter. Right. What happened to help you to find your peace? One thing I always tell people is it's okay to be bitter. Yes, I like <laughs> I that. I was bitter I for like two that, and a half years. I was the most bitter human ever. Yep. Um, she went into a coma. And two things really helped me find my peace. Well, three things. Mm -hmm. My sister pulled me into her room one day. I was, you read the book, so you know I talk about yes. how I was suicidal. Yes. Um, and I had it planned. My sister pulled me into the room and she said, would you rather have never got back together with her and just found out years later that she died of this disease? Mm -hmm. And that made me, gave me a sense of gratitude mm -hmm. for the fact that we got to spend her last five years together yeah. because she was going to die regardless. Mm -hmm. But we got those last five years together. That's um, a good point. The other thing that kind of brought me back was writing her eulogy while she was in hospice. Mm -hmm. um, and then just the fact that if she fought so hard, it wouldn't, I couldn't do that. I couldn't give up on her, 
her daughter or myself mm -hmm. that I had a fight too. Right, so this, that you had a whole different way of looking at it in your, in your mind. Right. And a different way of running the narrative. Right. Yeah, well that's a good point. And, uh, and Lisa, what, what about you? Talk to us about Eric and what happened and how you got where you are. Yeah, um, Eric's death was very sudden. He uh, was into mountaineering and ice climbing and rock climbing and um, Memorial Day weekend 2014, he was on a climb um, group of people climbing Mount Rainier on its um, most difficult route. And at some point during their trip, um, one night there was um, a rock fall and avalanche and he and the entire group were all killed. Mm. Um, so um, they, yeah, so I got a call from the National Park Service um, saying that there was a search and there was a rescue mission. And I remember, I think moments like this just stick in your mind. Mm -hmm. You know exactly where you were at the exact moment that you hear that. And then um, when they called back with a status update, they had changed it from a recovery mission to, or sorry, a rescue mission to a recovery wow. mission at that point. That must have been really hard to hear. Yes. Because you're holding hope that he's going to be okay. Yeah, absolutely. And I didn't really understand. I was not into mountain climbing myself. So yeah. I thought that they were just holed up, you know, in a tent somewhere mm -hmm. and they just had to go get them. And right. it was a lot more serious, um, obviously. And so after that, it was very hard for me. We were married about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. when he died. And because it was so sudden, I was in shock for a really long time and I had a hard time really understanding it. And I remember having these irrational thoughts, knowing that they were irrational, but nonetheless saying, but he can't be dead because we have our vacation next month mm -hmm. and things well, like... John saying, yes, he's, you know, he's resonating it just with this. seems this. so surreal. Yeah. And they never recovered his body. And mm -hmm. I think that also made it seem a little unreal. That like maybe a long it wasn't him or maybe he's coming back or maybe there was a mistaken identity or whatever. Sure. Well, those yeah. other people died, but he probably yeah. is going to climb down the mountain soon. Mm -hmm. And then this nightmare will be over. So I had a kind of it came to me in different ways over and over and over. Mm hmm. That makes sense. And, and maybe gra it's hard to wrap our arms. You guys are both. So when did this happen? What year? 2014. 2014. And when did Michelle die? January of 2016. These are very new losses. Mm -hmm. And I think it's hard for, for such a long time to wrap your arms around the, the permanence. Yes. Like this, they, they're not coming physically back. Yeah. It's just hard to believe it. Yeah. My brother was 17 when he died and I just couldn't believe it for many, many years. Um, it just takes and I think it's our body sometimes protecting us too from the, the whole reality it's like we visit in pieces I think for yes. me year two is when the reality hit mm -hmm. so year one was very much survival mm -hmm. and then year two is oh she's not coming back mm -hmm. that's when it hit for me at least and so the reality of okay this is this is real right and my mom's always saying that, that you thaw you thaw out the second year and it, it hits you sometimes right. the does. permanence they right. just keep being dead Yes, right? Yeah. Over and over and over. I've never heard it put that way. That's a pretty good way to put it. <laughs> You're going to put that in your rants, I'm aren't you? I'm going to put it in my next book and quote you. Yeah. Wow, yeah. Lisa, there you go. You're being quoted in his yeah. next book. Um, what about the idea, the word widow, widower? I mean, here you guys were in your 30s, and that was the word that people identified you with. How do you feel about that word? And what was that like? being so young with that word. You want to take it first? Sure. Um, well, to me, widow was a 110-year-old woman in a mantilla, like sitting in a church pew, gently weeping or something mm -hmm. in black. And I think that it is a weird word. It has a lot of, maybe I'm the only one who feels that way, but I associate it with an older experience. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I hear that a lot. Certainly, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember the first time I really 
thought of myself that way. And you know, grief sometimes ambushes you in ways you don't even anticipate. But I remember going to a doctor's appointment and you fill out the paperwork and you have to check, I don't know why, your marital status. Mm -hmm. And there it was. And I had to check that box. And it was so crazy. And there I was in a waiting room full of people. But you never know when it's going to hit you or how. But that I remember checking a widow box. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my God, Mm -hmm. this is my box now. And that, that this is your box now. John's nodding yes. That well, yeah, is... all of that. The emergency contact, too. Do you hate the emergency yes. contact? All yes. widowed people hate that because now you don't have your spouse to put down. Yeah. So I'm like 33 years old putting my mom back down. <laughs> um, yeah. For me, the word widow or widow, uh, widow, widower, I've kind of turned it around. A mm-hmm. lot of people hate it. I look at it as almost an empowering word now. Like okay. I have survived I like something I never thought I could survive and I'm not running from it. Mm-hmm. So that's what I try to tell my clients sometimes to to twist it around. It's not anything to be embarrassed about. It is a testament to your survival. Well, and that's important to widow widowers that are not 95 years old. Right. Um, So what about support? Did you, either one of you find support? I would think in the the widow widower community, there's a lot of support at the older ages. Because I've heard, you know, I worked with 9-11 widows for for 10 years after 9-11. I worked with the fire department. So the widows that lost firefighters were relatively young because firefighters are relatively young. Um, they were your age, they were in their 30s when this happened also. And they said that some of them said they went to support groups and everybody was w- much, much older. And so they couldn't identify with what they were going through. The, the first one I went to, everybody was 65 and older. I was okay. the only one, and I was 31. That um, must be hard in a way too, because you're like, wait a minute, why did this happen to me? Right. Um, my, one of my saving graces is connecting with other widowed people um, which I've done through my blog and my book and speeches and also just Facebook and stuff. Just knowing that there's other people around my age who have actually lost a spouse mm-hmm. or a lot of younger people. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know where I'd be if I hadn't connected with all the other widowed people. If I thought I, because you, you think you're the only one. You think yeah. you're on this island, you're the only one to have lost your spouse. And then you realize that, no, there's a lot of other people and they've survived and then you can survive too. I like that. And, t- and tell us about where you just were and what you were doing at Camp Widow. Yeah, so there's a Camp Widow, which mm-hmm. people are like, what is Camp Widow? Yeah. Do you camp? No, you don't camp. It's at a nice hotel. You don't camp. <laughs> um, I'm a speaker there. So I've had the privilege of speaking at three Camp Widows now. Mm-hmm. And it's basically three, 400 widowed people coming together. There are workshops, there are keynote speeches, there are social events. It's amazing. Um, it is, and yeah. we, we love Michelle Neff Hernandez and we partner with her and I've been to some of them. And uh, you're right, they're, they're just phenomenal. All the things that you do and all the rituals that happen. I mean, she had right. people like doing, painting s- stuff on rocks and going to the ocean right. and letting them go. I mean, there's a lot of really cool stuff that goes on there. It's life-changing to see that you're not alone. Mm-hmm. So for anyone out there that ha- is, is a brief spouse, Camp Widow. Look up Camp Widow and please go, go there. And what about mm-hmm. you, Lisa? Um, what, is, what has helped you? What has helped me was, um, I would say two things. One, I'm gonna echo what John said, is finding other people who are going through a similar thing. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate enough um, where I was living in New York City, there's a group for everybody and there was actually a young widow and widower group that I joined and I found that to be remarkably helpful. That's great. How did you find it on the internet? Uh, yeah, I just went just on, put young, I just Googled it. I was like, young widows, young widows That's New great. York, and it came up. And I was shocked to see how many of us there were. Mm-hmm. And it was sad, but also comforting. helpful to me and comforting. Yeah. Um, that you're not alone. Because I would alone. imagine you guys at the beginning felt like, I'm alone. Sure. You look um, outside and go, wait a minute, nobody's had this experience. Yeah, and odds are you don't know anyone else yeah. um, yeah. because it's statistically smaller, but it doesn't mean it's non-existent. Mm-hmm. That's a and good And there point. are enough of us. So that was great. And it was just sometimes you want someone to just talk about how bad it is and Mm -hmm. get it in a way that other people, thank goodness, don't get it. Mm -hmm. And that's been helpful. And the other thing that I did for myself was I was kind of proactive in reaching out to people. I find that after one year, people think that you're kind of okay again. 
And they've all resumed their lives, mm -hmm. and they kind of figure you're okay now. That happened. Well, last they want year. you to be over it. They do. And, and the Absolutely. reality is, we get over. We might get over intense, intense pain long term, but we don't get over the person that died. Why would we want to get over Eric and Michelle and Scott? Yeah, we are who we are because they were in our lives. We don't know? ever move on. We move forward. That's the oh, thing like everyone that. says. Yeah. We don't move on. We move forward. Right. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. So I think just if. Don't wait for people to come to you and ask how you're doing. Go to them. Call your friends up and say, hey, I'm feeling a little you know, down today. Do you want to grab lunch this week or something like that? But empower yourself with your own healing. Don't wait for it to come to you necessarily. So you kind of have to teach people to be grief, good grief support sometimes. Yes. And let them know what you need. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, with, so looking at your book, John, Rants, Raves, and Randoms, give us a couple of rants or raves. Anything of any um, offhand? The most popular thing I've yes. ever written is a blog called Sit Down and Shut Up. Sit Down and Shut Up. And, and w about a year after my wife passed, she was sick for two and a half years, so mm -hmm. I had a lot of anticipatory grief. So about a year after she passed, I decided I wanted to try dating again. Mm -hmm. And I got backlash for that. And mm -hmm. then on um, Valentine's Day, one of my friends also decided she wanted to start dating again, and she got backlash for that. And, and I, was the backlash just, okay, it's too soon? What, what were people saying? Too soon, um, people think it, you know, you don't love your spouse because mm -hmm. why are you dating again? That type of thing. Yeah. So I had a couple glasses of wine in me, and it was Valentine's Day, and yeah. I was already in a bad mood because my wife is dead. Yes. And um, I wrote Sit Down and Shut Up, and it basically just kind of went off on people that, you know, mm -hmm. they're not allowed to judge us when yeah. they get to go home to their spouse. Yeah. And we don't. So that's in the book. That was my most popular one ever. Oh, um, that's good. There's other rants and raves in there. I, when I made the book, my vision was someone sitting on an airplane, having the book in their hands, crying on one page and then laughing on it, the other page. It, you do it well. <laughs> right. it, it is that type of book. Yeah. I mean, there's so many things in it you say. I mean, at one point you're saying, time doesn't necessarily heal all wounds. I still, I, you say it better than I can. I still miss Michelle. It's been, it's been a while. I still yeah. miss her every day. Yeah, I think... That the, the longing for them, the absence of them, becomes more intense. The grief itself lessens, mm -hmm. but the missing for their touch becomes mm -hmm. more intense. That makes sense. Yeah. And you can be touch deprived. I mean, you've lost your spouse. Skin hunger. Skin hunger. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. What are some of the things that have been said to you as young widows, widowers, that were not helpful, that were stupid? <laughs> Where do we start going? Yeah, yeah, right? I don't... <clears throat> um, I'm sure oh, there's some... you look so thin, but in like a complimentary way when really I just hadn't eaten in a couple of yeah. weeks. Um, I got asked if I was going to go back to my maiden name mm. because I wasn't married very long. Wow. Um, well, even... I, would think on, I would think on that people would say at least you weren't married that long. That's the thing. At least anything where you're you starting, were young. At least you didn't have children. Anything yes. you're starting with at least when you're talking at about grief, you... at least they pass quickly. At least, you know, oh, you didn't watch them die. At least you had two years. At least you had 50 years. At least you're, you're still You're minimizing young. people's pain. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. at least you can get remarried someday. I mean, right. all those kind of things aren't helpful right. because no. like you said, it minimizes your loss, right? right? I just had to develop a mantra, they mean well, they mean well, they mean well. And I would just always say that to myself I because like it's very complicated to yes. try to express condolences. They're, they're trying to make you feel better. They really are. And they're trying to fix it. And I remember when I started dating again and I had someone just say, I was so happy when you started dating again because it made me feel like you were okay now. Mm-hmm. And I, one does not correct the other. Right. Right. So. And I know you've gotten remarried. Yes. And you're not, not remarried. Not remarried. <laughs> and I also know that your new husband, what's his name? Brody. Brody, who must be a very special person, because I'm sure that Eric is still po is, is is in your life. He is still in your life. Yeah. Um, but Brody doesn't replace Eric. No. And Eric doesn't replace Brody, because that's not the way it works. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's important for people out there that aren't, haven't had this kind of loss, because yeah. sometimes there's, there's misconceptions. Absolutely. Yeah. Right? Do you Completely. feel that, John? Oh, yeah. That's part of the sit down and shut up. Like, <laughs> yeah. Nobody I ever date or marry or fall in love again will replace Michelle. Right. And, and it has to be, I imagine, a person that would allow Eric to come in, in, you know, in metaphorical ways and to continue those bonds. Sure. Um, so Brody is actually a widower. Oh, okay. So, so he, he gets I it. 
yeah, and I feel like I'm fortunate in that way because it's not taboo to have a photo up. Mm -hmm. It's not a taboo to right. tell an anecdote or a story, but I know that it can be for other people because there can be a jealousy there or... Yes, I've seen it a lot. Yeah, and of course, I think most people, the closest thing they in their own life have to equate that to is perhaps a breakup or a divorce, in which case you are actively trying to forget that person to be with this current one. Right. That is not the case in a widowed situation, and I think that the faith that that person has to have is that there is room enough for you both. Well, that's it. I always say our hearts are big and we can love yeah. a lot of many people. Yeah. What are the things, oh, so let's talk about men and women's grief. How are they different? John, what do you think? You're, you're, you're um, wrapping around this community and thousands of people are visiting you every day on your blog. Well, most what men do don't see? want to show their grief like I do. They don't want to show you. So, so it's amazing that you're showing it Yeah. and making it okay out there. Yeah, I think I'm one of the only few men, especially younger men, that is so raw with their grief. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that I see a ton of differences other than that in mm -hmm. grieving people. What do you think? I think that maybe it's not a question of whether men or women grieve differently, but whether men and women are allowed to right. grieve yeah, the like same. That. And I think there are societal expectations that are very different. And I think John was saying um, most men, I feel, almost have to be strong and prove something and mm -hmm. be stoic. And I think women may have more of an expectation that they will be more teary or visibly upset. Um, and I think that there's a different expectation that, of what correct grief looks I, I, like. I like that you're saying this, and I'm wondering, you know, research shows that older men, which doesn't, doesn't fall into this category, tend to get married quicker than, than widows. And I'm wondering if there was an expectation for you, John, from the outside world that you would get married quicker. I, I don't know. Maybe I don't, there's not. I don't know that there's an expectation of that. Um, I think sometimes men like need someone to take care of them. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> so yeah. they're more likely to just die right in. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to change the perspective that men have, where it's uh -huh. not... Not crying, I feel like, doesn't necessarily make you strong. It's when you're crying on the floor so hard, and then somehow you get up the next day. That's strength. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to get men to understand that, that they don't have to always hide their grief. And women, too, because actually a lot of women try to hide their grief. And, and I, you're making a good point, and I know that sometimes people are terrified of grieving because they're afraid they'll be so overwhelmed they won't be able to function. Some days you won't. Okay, well, that's good right. to know, because I know that guys say, Heidi, I'm afraid to go down that road. And, and I know that we, we talked to an NFL quarterback, Eric Hipple, and I said before on a show that we wrote a book, Real Men Do Cry With Him, and he said he set a timer sometimes when he had to, if he had to function, like he said, I would set a timer for 20 minutes for my son, and I would go into those spaces of grief, and then I would get up and do something like jumping jacks or push-ups or sit-ups to get back into a headspace. Yeah. Because I couldn't, I had to go out and go to work. Right. So. No, I think that's good. I mean, as my, it's been two and a half years for me. Mm-hmm. The grief changes and it evolves yeah. and there's things that I no longer do like I, I purposely won't listen to sad music anymore mm. because if I'm having a good day I don't want to go down that road yeah that's so there's so you know yourself now and you right. know where the triggers are and you're like you know sometimes I don't want to do that right. and sometimes, sometimes I, I do, do. right and so I can kind of control it sometimes right so that's it sounds like that's thing, something that's been helpful what are the other things that um, for both of you that have helped you over you know find hope and helped you in this journey do you understand? Yeah, um, yoga was very helpful to me, mm -hmm. actually, and I would say it was very helpful physically as well as emotionally because I think that grief can be very physically debilitating. Mm -hmm. And I remember just being so, I felt like I was hit by a truck and walking around the block was just exhausting. And so for me, just starting very slowly, taking in an easy yoga class, something like that was really nurturing and writing uh, was really helpful and just to get things out and... Um, and when you say writing, where would you write? Would you just write for yourself or...? Um, no, I actually um, was, had published a few grief-related pieces in mm -hmm. Modern Loss as well as the Washington Post. Oh, that's wonderful. And I have a post and the, um, 
Washington Post piece about the second year of widowhood. Oh, interesting. And the second year of widowhood in Washington Post, so people can find it yes, online. Yes, yes. Um, the second year of widowhood being as hard as the first. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and it was really helpful, but also to hear the feedback from it and having that, oh, me too, you mm -hmm. get that, is great. I love that. And what about you, John? I would say writing has been the biggest thing for me. Mm -hmm. The book, the blog, pouring my emotion out, I feel better. And, and when you started writing, did you just pick up a piece of paper and just start kind of pouring it out? When she was sick, I would share a lot on my personal Facebook page. Mm -hmm. um, and then towards the end of her life, the last you know month or so, I would pretty much pour my heart out on my personal Facebook page. So it started then, and I saw that it was helping me. Mm -hmm. It would help me when she was laying there, sleeping or in a coma, and I would pour my heart out. Um, it, it made me feel a little less desperate. And it sounds like because you, of how honest you are, you would get a lot of, both of you, in your writing, brings people in, and then they can support you, and they can also share their own experiences in a very honest, candid way. Right. And then you're helping people. Yes. <laughs> helping other people, whether it's through the book or my coaching or whatever. Every time I get on the phone with somebody and do a coaching call. I'm helping them, but I'm helping myself. I'm learning more about myself and my own grief and my own healing. Mm, I love that. So, so how do people find you? Lisa, we'll start with you. Yes, you can go to my website, www.lisacolbruland.com, and you'll be able to find my bylines on grief um, there. Uh, or you can just Google my name and you know some pieces will come up on grief. Okay, great. It's the best way. And John? Uh, you could Google me, John Polo, or okay. you could just go to the website and it's betternotbitterwidower.com, uh, matching Facebook page, which I post to almost every day. And then the book is on my website and it's on Amazon. And I love the book because you can literally pick it up anywhere. It does, you don't have to read it cover to cover. And like John said, you laugh, you cry, or I mean, it's a lot of different emotions. I designed it for people who have ADD and grief brain like myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. Yeah. Okay, so what's one really quick, we have to wrap up, we have about 30 seconds, one piece of advice for, for people out there that are trying to figure out how to survive after the death of a spouse. John? I would say when she was sick, nobody could look me in the eyes and say, I know the pure hell you're going through. Mm -hmm. I know that you think you can survive, but you will. Um, and you will rebuild in time. That would be my advice. I know that deep pain, but you can rebuild in time and survive it. That's great. Lisa? I'd say don't think about whether or not people are judging you. Oh, that's good. Just go forward in your life the way you know is best. Well, thank you both so thank much you. for being on the show and uh, talking about spouse loss. And you definitely don't care what people are thinking, and that's why you're reaching so many. So uh, thanks for watching. This is opentohope.com in partnership with the Compassionate Friends. Thank you.